my story, I guess, as a design educator. Um, I started uh, as a part-time instructor at the top left picture. That's Emily Carr Institute of Art and Design. And then I moved to um, Hong Kong, where I'm from. So I, at the Polytechnic University in Hong Kong. So in 2006, I moved back. And um, that was a bit of a culture shock, I guess, because I was educated in the UK and in, in Canada. So there was a cultural difference there, for sure. But I'm not really talking about national differences uh, so much today. And then I, I moved to Reading for two years, uh, where I studied. Uh, well, Jerry was my teacher um, in MA type, typeface design, one of the earlier cohorts. Uh, I was there for, for two years, and then uh, in 2017, I moved back to Hong Kong, and I'm now at Ho the Hong Kong Design Institute. So there's, I've been teaching across a spectrum of not only different countries, but also different types of institutions. Um, so Emily Carr is a traditional art school, and now it's Emily Carr University, but it's an art and design university. So it has a different kind of ethos about what design is or how to practice design. It's a very practical, kind of practice-oriented environment. I went to the Polytechnic University, which was very applied, but also had you know, a, a, research, a research agenda, which Emily Carr didn't have at the time. And then I moved on to Reading, which was a very research-intensive university teaching mostly postgraduate students. And then now I'm, I've ended up uh, at a vocational and professional education uh, institution, which is very much career-oriented. So I'll share with you a few thoughts about these different kind of institutional cultures or different schools of thoughts about teaching typography. So, you know, in terms of cultures, we can talk about language or script cultures. We're very familiar with that. We're talking about national culture as well or institutional cultures but I'm gonna focus on this, pedagogical cultures, and the, the kinds of values, beliefs, or actions that we might hold or we might um, do uh, across these cultures. Um, when we talk about typography, I, I think we all know that when we, we practice typography within a graphic design environment, and within the broader kind of a definition of design as a problem. So it's very much a problem-based activity. You start with a problem. And we don't do this, really. That implies a very procedural kind of uh, understanding of design or process of design. We have actually multiple um, kind of possibilities that we need to kind of sift through uh, in order to get to a final solution. So that's of very, you know, it's, it's not really uh, answering a, uh, a question or problem with one answer. There are many different possible answers. So how do we really handle multiple possibilities? And moreover, how do we handle qu a question, a problem, that kind of engenders even more questions in a design process? So this is the gist of the talk today. I'm not gonna go through that now. We're gonna look at this later. So as graphic designers, we're very kind of interested in things that have kind of a novelty factor, something that's new or something that's very shocking. And these kind of projects, I'm not naming the designer, but I think maybe Wang knows who the designer was. Um, so this is a book on a sculpture, actually. A work of a sculpture is a kind of like a catalog of work, and it's kind of the, the foil that's used kind of mimics the work of, the, of a graphic designer. So the big kind of idea takes over the entire context of communication uh, as the main, the main dish of communication. So design can override content and use, but the values that we hold as graphic designers in the field right now I, I dare say the majority of the field, at least in Hong Kong, it's about shock value, it's about novelty value, it's about creating something that's new and unseen. And uh, I have this kind of a struggle 
as a, as a young, I guess, faculty member at, at Emily Carr about the idea of experimental typography. Um, I remember the first job interview I had at Emily Carr was, uh, actually one of my students was on a committee as well. And uh, they were saying, oh, um, do you think we should start with rules or do you think we should start with experimentation? And my answer then was experimentation, of course, because that was how I was taught, actually, at, at the institution. Um, but I, I wonder what experimentation really mean. This is uh, like a scroll down of uh, Pinterest uh, when I typed in experimental typography. So I, uh, when I started at the Hong Kong Design Institute, uh, I had to already review the curriculum uh, and I see, you know, some typography in there. There's introduction to ty typography on the left. And also on the right, the second course, the second module was experimental typography. And then experimental book design. So I started to chat to our colleagues, you know, what do we really mean by experimental typography or experimental book design? They had a pretty kind of clear uh, idea in mind. It was not the process, it was not the methodology, it was a particular style of expression of using typography as visual elements. So the idea of the novelty factor, something creating something new to them, you know, was what experimentation really meant. But they actually had an idea of, of a particular look. Uh, I'm jumping back and forth. Uh, on the timeline. So this was, I think, 2007 or 2008. Um, I revamped the curriculum, uh, the typography curriculum at um, the Polytechnic University. And then I wrote an additional uh, elective. This, so this was not a compulsory module. This was an elective. And the name of it, I don't think they run this anymore because I'm not there anymore. Nobody knew how to run it, I guess. or. Nobody understood what I meant by convention and subversion. But I think that really sets a lot about my personal struggle between two different perspectives or schools of thought about what typography is or could be. So I tend to not use the word rule because rules kind of imply that it's immutable. It has to be done. Uh, it's, it's imperative. But I tend to explain... Uh, explain it as conventions because conventions vary according to contexts. So if you read the, uh, the description, this course investigates both the functional and experimental approaches to typographic design. Discipline freedom, actually it's a, uh, it's a term I picked up from uh, calligraphy, is the premise of the course where students begin with examining how linguistic and visual conventions shape the reading process in print-based design. Students learn how to establish a complex typographic structure and design with a traditional typographic sensibility. They then explore new possibilities of subverting established conventions through an inquisitive design process that encourages risk-taking. Sounds really grand. <laughs> so I was really thinking about you know, well, we, we all know what learning outcomes are. Um, I, I was really kind of struggling between making informed typographic decisions and trying to take risks that actually um, venture outside of these conventions. I'm going to show you results uh, later. Um, technology has always been kind of quite central uh, to the teaching of typography or the practices of typography. Uh, so I kind of, uh, you know, uh, the Western, I mean, Stanley Morrison, I think uh, Jerry mentioned Stanley Morrison yesterday, the first principles of typography. Uh, there's this kind of su supremacy of letterpress as a technology that kind of created a lot of these kind of conventions that we still kind of uh, use today. But actually it extends, I think it extends far further than letterpress uh, technology, because a brush is a technology as well. Paper is a technology. And the tools kind of have a very inherent kind of a characteristic combined with the physical kind of manipulation of 
of using our hands or arms, combine, combining to make very specific kind of forms that became familiar to us. So the tools was a good place to start, I thought. Uh, so the first class, that hasn't actually changed, I, I, although I don't really teach so much these days. Um, to use the calligraphic tool, well, the broad edge pen, which is you know, quite uh, you know, an important writing implement, uh, to demonstrate letter form anatomy. So we made these spousal wood pens so it's just basically wooden dowel, cut a slit in the middle, and just put a, a piece of balsa wood in it. Extremely cheap. So I get students to do it. I show it how to, I show show it to them how to do it, and just get some Chinese ink and some soy sauce dishes and start to kind of under, not not to kind of not to teach them how to be a calligrapher, but using the tool to understand. Oh, actually, these forms came from these tools. And then, and then I, you, you see these demo sheets, right? These are from a long time ago, actually, to, to demonstrate like overshoots, or upper lowercase, X height, uh, proportions of letter forms, the difference between Roman and Italic and oblique. And then uh, when I went to Hong Kong, it extended to, to become uh, brush as well as the broad edge pen, and also uh, learning about expansion contrast and translation contrast and also uh, proportions in terms of Chinese uh, character construction. So, so I added that later on. So as I said, you know, I believed experimentation was the key to everything to, to start with, because I think this process uh, really kind of infused an enthusiasm into the students about form about form in general. And uh, there's something magical about you know, using a balsa wood pen to create marks, to make marks. So after that calligraphy kind of demonstration and learning about anatomy, we move on to word expression. So the key was not to find one answer to a solution, but to really find possibilities in form giving and how that kind of can be applied later on in a piece of communication. So for a week or so, two weeks, they used the balsa wood pen or they used any other tools that they could find. Or this one is masking tape actually at the bottom. The, the, the top one was uh, uh, the calligraphic tool. And the idea was not to make sure that they create letter forms that are by convention perfect. I wanted them to experience what the tool would give them the possibilities. So this was from a critique. I asked them to lay everything out. It has to be 50 or more. The idea is to have a large volume of stuff to look at. Uh, and then the critique was about how to narrow it down to serve particular communication goals. So from those expirations came 50 layouts. So they had to choose appropriate forms, doesn't matter if it's th they're not perfect, some of them are very expressive, and apply them in a very simple layout with a short piece of continuous text, I guess, the definition of, uh, of, of the word in a square format. So it's a very, very traditional kind of Bauhaus kind of exercise, but with uh, a divergent and convergent process built in to allow students to be able to make informed decisions. So every layout had a particular goal in mind. So uh, how about a poetic one? And how about a playful, a playful one as opposed to an entertaining one? How about authoritative and formal? What are the differences? I'm not trying to, I, was, I, I wasn't trying to give them definitive answers of what these are. I asked them to explore. What are the possibilities? Combining word expressions with a layout to communicate a certain uh, meaning. So that's a pretty traditional kind of a exercise. And uh, when I went to Hong Kong, I think I faced a lot of the problems that you know the previous speakers have uh, laid out. I guess 
about uh, teaching typography in an Asian country. Um, we didn't really, we, we, we don't really have a lot of resources of how to teach lettering or typography uh, in Hong Kong or in China. So I worked with uh, uh, a very well-known type designer in Hong Kong, one of the very few actually, Sammy Orr. Um, uh, he's been designing typefaces since uh, he, he, was, he worked at Monotype actually on the, the um, uh, rast, uh, what, what do you call those, uh, laser comp machine fonts. And then he designed the, the uh, he was part of the team for the uh, MTR, the, the underground system, the signage font. He was on the signage team. It wasn't a font, actually. It was a, a set of drawings, basically, at the time. So I worked with him, and we developed some teaching material on, uh, again, this, this, this comes from uh, kind of letter forms first, before typography, I guess. The aim was not to train them to be type designers at all. But through this kind of exercise, these exercises of creating characters with different means, to be able to, in, uh, to uh, for them to experience how how a letter how a Chinese character is constructed. So we start with bitmap, nine by nine bitmap, and then we moved on to uh, I think this is twenty four by twenty four. The reason why we started with bitmap was because it's very easy to handle. It's not intimidating. There are only you know nine by nine squares, and eighty one squares. 81 decisions you have to make, on or off, right? Very, very simple. So they were really courageous in terms of, you know, creating something uh, that's creative, but also legible. Uh, because with 9x9, nine nine, 81 squares, you cannot really um, describe every stroke possible uh, in a character. So you have to uh, decide what to leave out and how to kind of uh, simplify forms. And then in the 24 by 24, actually that, that's too many actually, we, we moved on to 12 by 12 after. You start to have to think about uh, structure. 9 by 9 you don't really have to think about structure. And then from that, uh, move, moving on to uh, Song Ti and Hei Ti, serif or sans serif if you will, and to really create very conventional letter forms. Not what well, they they did try to inject some variety in it, but mainly it was to create a set of uh, characters that really um, reflect the the, the the most conventional forms. Uh, actually, that the, the order is different. Actually, we we did Chinese calligraphy first, Kai Ti, the script, uh, to understand traditional calligraphic constructions, and then the skeletons. To skeletal form, so you can see the top. Uh, the top example uh, has a kind of more wide, kind of middle part of the character, whereas the bottom one is tighter, more traditional, classical in proportion. So we explore skeletal forms as well as calligraphic forms, and then it and then it was this because Song Ti came from Kai Shu, this one. So the one on the right, that calligraphic script, kind of became this uh, Song Ti. Uh, so it was this order that we did it. And then the second part of this uh, module was to develop, uh, well, a, a typeface, quote unquote. Uh, of course, we couldn't get them to design the whole, the, the uh, tens of thousands of characters. So it was this coming up with a system. So with a selection of characters uh, so I asked them to write a brief first. There had to be uh, an application for this uh, so-called typeface. So this was one of the uh, directions that we, we, we went through because we thought, you know, having conceived a typeface really can inform um, the way you, you apply typefaces in your design. But another approach was uh, to not design a typeface after those exercises was to apply into an identity uh, for a festival, actually, so in a poster format. Um, so we tried both. So this one is combining calligraphy with some geometric letter forms. This, this one actually used uh, 
the bitmap as a jumping off point to uh, construct characters. So that is a very kind of traditional way of handling the typo typography pedagogy in a graphic design context. But uh, you know, after going through the Reading experience, I was very much interested in reading. <laughs> The, the pun, I don't know what, who came up with that pun, reading and reading. Uh, do you know, Jerry? Was it Paul Stiff? <laughs> okay. And um, to kind of really think about what the reading process entails, uh, this brain scan is very interesting because reading words uh, is different from seeing words. The, the activation of the brain is two sides, which is quite interesting because you're not just, you're not just reading, you're, you're viewing as well the visual forms. This wasn't from a calligraphy, uh, I mean typography book. It was from a history of reading, actually. So I think that's very interesting because uh, you have to process the linguistic aspects, but you also have to process the visual aspects, which can be codes uh, that we can inject into a piece of communication. Uh, and also, you know, eye tracking data uh, looks at how we read. It's, it's actually jumping uh, and fixating on on you know, on a line, sometimes quite arbitrary points, and that's where perception occurs. And uh, we use different strategies and different font variants to articulate uh, where people stop and uh, pick up information. So that's venturing into more kind of uh, informational aspects about typographic communication. Uh, I always use this example to, to, to show how without articulation how difficult it is to access uh, inform relevant information that you're looking for. You have to search in a very linear way, and it compromises understanding. And on the other hand, you know, looking at, at a calligraphic reference, uh, this calligrapher it's a, it's a piece of calligraphy that you can't read, but there's a lot of articulation in there through uh, mark making that can focus your eyes on different areas of, of this piece of calligraphy. So I, I, I found that just for Chuck's position very interesting, and you know, uh, just as technology uh, or writing implement writing implements and uh, type making technology uh, influence how letter forms look, uh, the formats, uh, substrates, and formats influence the the way information is accessed. Um, be it uh, an inscription to a, that's a very old Kindle, to a codex format, to uh, an accordion fold or scroll, that kind of influence how we access text. And then looking at comparison between the East and the West, they were very they were very distinct kind of uh, developments. Uh, a lot of it was because of the technology and the available resources. Uh, the Chinese adopted a much simpler uh, technology. Uh, it was a, a craft-based mass production process rather than using very precise machinery. Um, so, you know, looking at, well, this is uh, Robert Etienne, uh, one of the Venetian printers, looking at structure and access of uh, navigation of text, like Jerry was showing yesterday and the, the available resources that you can use, articulate text. This is a, uh, a wood engraving uh, instead of an illumination for the drop caps and diff a, a, a few different sizes of text, page numbers and paragraph numbers. These are all conventions that have been developed over time to kind of improve access to information. And because of the constraints or the resources available uh, for uh, articulation. Color wasn't actually used so much, but, in, uh, but instead other things have been developed like variant of font variants like italic, bold, and different typefaces and different sizes were developed. Uh, here we see, we see a time, kind of a, a historical uh, instructional text that really doesn't have a lot of articulation and differentiation. And then later we see hand uh, coloring to help with articulation uh, and navigating the text. 
and then the, the uh, development of advertising uh, after the Industrial Revolution. This is the streets of London, painting of the streets of, uh, of, of the streets of London, gave rise to different formats and substrates and different typefaces that performed a very different um, communication role on the street. And we had things like that. This is from Reading's collection. But in the East, we had a completely different uh, kind of way of doing things because uh, color, color printing with multiple colors was uh, already available in, in the Yuan Dynasty because the technology was much cheaper to print colors with wood blocks. So we see very complex paratexts. Um, nobody has ever really looked at, designers have never looked at these complex documents. You know, there are, there are two uh, annotators for this text, and there are these marks that kind of highlight different areas in the main text as commentary. So you see even more annotators in some of these books, and even more colors, and even different styles for the margin notes, the top margin notes. So these things are very important in terms of understanding the kinds of things, the kinds of ways that we use to navigate around a complex structured text. This is also quite far back uh, from my days at Emily Carr in Canada. And the technology, kind of getting students to try technologies that are, that are pretty much obsolete, but to understand the kinds of resources that they can use to articulate the text. Uh, I thought this was a very interesting um, uh, experimentation, I guess, in teaching. So I bought two typewriters, actually. Th these are daisy wheel typewriters. Uh, in fact, I found like a box with several different daisy wheels outside student services. I still remember there were like small caps and different typefaces, a script uh, for these computers, uh, uh, not computers, for these typewriters. So I went to Salvation Army and bought two of these typewriters for 10, 10 bucks each. And students were <laughs> really excited. <laughs> and to, to really, and I said, you, know, you can change the font, just change the daisy wheel and see, see what happens. You can use spatial queuing to, uh, to articulate the text. And then they used handwriting as well. I said, well, use different writing Im implements. If you want a bold, use a thicker pen, right? So stencils, I bought a whole bunch of stencils from a stationery store and uh, bought a whole bunch of uh, really cheap uh, uh, let, uh, Macanorma. This is a uh, dry transfer lettering that pe a designer wanted to get rid of. And they just went crazy with it. Um, uh, okay. So just trying to kind of, the, the main aim was articulating the text, basically. It was a quote I, I gave them. Uh, one, one quote were from, was from Jeff Keady. I think Jerry uh, showed a, a quote from the same passage. And then, um, and then uh, Stanley Morrison's uh, First Principles of Typography. So the idea, you know, it went from a very kind of articulation exercise into an authorship exercise because students started to interpret or reinterpret the text that they were trying to articulate. And um, so the, the brief was very kind of self-indulgent. <laughs> so zine, um, uh, the size was, in, in Canada we use uh, US, US sizes, so US legal sizes is a very long p uh, page, eight and a half by 14. So a quarter of that. Uh, because uh, you can print that, uh, you, you can uh, run that off on, your, on, on a photocopier. It's a very kind of rough and ready kind of uh, reinterpretation exercise. So the, the designer became the author as well and manipulated the content. So this was uh, one of the results, a very raw kind of about author and reader, and kind of sorting or cutting out all the, the text and kind of reordering them, yeah. To Stanley Morris and typography is defined as arranging and controlling the space between reader and author. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this project um, I started running when I first started teaching in 2003. Um, 
and the idea for this project was I was struggling to because I hadn't teach hadn't been teaching before so uh, I went to dinner with a few friends uh, that evening and uh, and the, the the restaurant was the alibi room I don't know whether it's still there in Vancouver it's uh, it's a very cool space and um, and there was a bookshelf in the corner of uh, movie scripts actually so these are really doc great documents to work with and I came up came up with this brief uh, just like that actually that night and it's about um, a craft based tradition I guess of typography uh, so the techniques of uh, setting really good type uh, of a complex with a complex structure in a very conventional genre of uh, a paperback book so it's a screenplay uh, so I asked them to convert from like a a very standard uh, format into a publishable format uh, and it's a series as well so design and device a comprehensive set of typographic specifications so it's not about a one-off project it's not about interpreting it's about providing an environment for people to comfortably navigate uh, in a complex uh, complexly structured text so typography typographic specifications for the interior typography of a paperback screenplay series so they thought oh what kind of project is this there's no design in it it's typesetting. Why don't we design the cover? Isn't that what book design is about, designing a cover? No, actually, we're designing a series. We're designing a system. So I, I, it's a very specific brief, right? As, as a paperback screenplay series to be sold at bookstores for a general audience who are interested in films. And then a series title. And, um, so the, the film is Brazil. I mean, it doesn't matter which one it is because they're not going to interpret it. It's not about that. So format, they have to think about the trim size, but uh, they had to think about signatures and how to utilize a full sheet and look at uh, common formats of paperbacks in bookstores. And they can only use one serif typeface for the main text, uh, or with a, an additional sans serif if they like. Uh, black and white only, you can use screens. Everything has to be done in one text box in InDesign. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, these are the criteria. One te single text frame for the running text. All spacing adjustments should be done internally using indents, tabs, and paragraph spaces. Right. Uh, so very strict, kind of very craft-based uh, brief. And I taught it uh, using a very apprenticeship mode of teaching to really coach them uh, on it. I'm not going to go through the process, I guess. Um, yeah. So the, that's the file they get. It's a terribly formatted. Um, well, this is the conventional way of formatting screenplay. I think it was generated from a screenplay writing app uh, and then exported as a text file. So all the indents are done with spaces and things like that. So they had to clean it up and use some search and replace functions and whatnot to clean it up. And they had to analyze the structure of the text so I've been running this ever since I started teaching. And this is one of the results, I guess. But the most interesting thing was uh, the specifications. So it, they had to create a set of specifications that they could pass on to a team of people to work on this. They're not going to be there to oversee it or to produce it. It has to be understandable to a team in the future to be able to you know, uh, work on this series. And then later on, I actually introduced uh, a, a component of using CSS and HTML to format these. Uh, and it kind of flows quite naturally into that direction, whereas InDesign seems to be a very dumb tool for, for something like that. So yeah, InDesign settings. So I still hold this kind of um, very traditional craft-based view of typographic design that I think students must learn. And after this project, they start to see things like margins very, very differently, leadings, very minute details, very, very differently. Whereas before they, oh, just set a default margin. No, you really have to look at 
exactly how you want to set this out and to think systematically. And then, you know, this experimental streak came back as well. So why not try to break this? So this was the convention and, and subver subversion uh, version of the, of the module where I gave them an MP3 file of a particular scene and they had to interpret that. And of course, they, had, they, they really loved that. And I even had a, an installation project one year. Um, throughout the campus, they just had to find a, they had to do an installation of that particular segment of the movie. So <laughs> I'm still wondering about this. You know? <laughs> so we have two types of, ap two approaches, I guess. So very inwardly focused designers, which are the, the more kind of traditional view of what graphic designers do as creators. So designer as creator, it's about taste, it's about aesthetic sense, it's about personal visions of visual language and concepts. And the designer interject as an author or interpreter of the content. But we also have uh, now, I think increasingly, we need to think of designers as enablers. We create systems and infrastructures, uh, strategies for things to happen. Uh, so th I think both have a, a lot of value in visual communication. I want to show you this video, uh, just play it.
context that we are operating under in terms of typography. So it's no longer an image on a page because with print, it was an image on a page. Yes, there is text structure navigation, but but with uh, tech, uh, electronic text, there is a back end of uh, the, the conceptual or meta, meta way of thinking about text structures that are separate from the visualization of it. So I think this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, of course, you know this was more than 10 years ago. Now it's even more relevant. Uh, we have machine learning now and um, artificial intelligence. That's also going to change what typography could be about. I think this is really typography. So, you know, I kind of uh, uh, put typography in the context of user experience design. Uh, this is uh, Jesse Garrett's uh, framework uh, of moving increasingly from the, uh, the abstract to the concrete in terms of shaping a communication experience. And the idea that every link is a search query uh, that uh, the, the, the software kind of brings together data and through, uh, sifting, th sifting through a database and a template to create a page that's dynamic. So that really changes our idea of what a document really is. It's no longer about the artifact. So just a quick demo of me metadata for books. You know, you can write a paragraph like that. And these are the uh, fields and records so we're looking at semantic segmentation of this content to be able to articulate the text. So it's not about the look of it. It's not about selecting this text and then making it bold. It's about articulating the structure, which is meaning, really, the structure of meaning. So, so that uh, kind of informs my kind of more recent philosophy of teaching typography. This was a brief that I used uh, when I was uh, running an MA information design course at Reading. Uh, the first project was shopping. And uh, I, evolved, I evolved it from a previous uh, project of a catalog, actually, uh, an Argos catalog for electronics. I thought, no, this is it's not about the artifacts. It's about the, the, the stuff behind it. So you're hired by a retailer as an information architect and designer to consult on the shopping experience uh, and, and also the visual display of information. So it's about the back end stuff. It, it's not so much about the visual expression. It is also about that. But it's more about labeling, organizing, planning, the metadata structure behind. Well, this is not actually even a, a typography brief, but you know, but putting typography in the context, information design, information architecture. So they deliver a design documentation and prototypes in in Vision. So this is one of the results. Um, it's a documentation basically that looks at the the flow of information looking at the metadata structure, the taxonomy of how to segment the content, uh, actual screen designs for the interface, but also you know the typographic specifications that came out of it. So it's a very different way of looking at typography because we're in a very kind of dynamic system that we're creating, for, uh, uh, infrastructure for information to, to exist and to be visualized. So. You know, typography is about differentiation persuasion. This is not going to go away. In advertising, we run an advertising program at Hong Kong Design Institute. It's about differentiating in terms of branding. Uh, it's about be being able to stand out from others. It's about persuading people to buy things or to do things. It is still about immersive reading. There's less of it, but you know, it still exists. Uh, a lot of it is about task-based reading, uh, reading in order to get something done. This is a printed thing, but it can also be digital. It's about system thinking. It's about uh, creating environments. Uh, it's about creating parameters for content to exist. And increasingly, we need, need to use, we, we to uh, get user uh, feedback uh, on how a piece of communication performs. 
Uh, eye tracking, uh, it's a way or observing users, shadowing users, testing artifacts to see how the typography works. And I think we've seen a lot of this uh, these two days about cultural heritage, um, about breaking away from that Eurocentric view of typography, sorry, <laughs> Europeans. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot to be done to, to break away from that notion to really come up with things that we can relate in different parts of the world for our communication, communication contexts. So this is the model I, I use. Typography is in, in between technology and language because technology is the feasibility of how to kind of disseminate and originate the message. And then we have culture and aesthetics, uh, which has a lot to do with the context of use, the kinds of habits, the, 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 the ways we communicate specific to a locale. And the aesthetics emerges from that. So typography, moving on, it's really about the content origination, distribution, and consumption, really. It's very wide, of course, and it includes images as well, and interactivity and environments and things like that. But this is really what, what um, we're about, really. Uh, we need to rethink some of these models of originating content, uh, visualizing content, and how we, how we distribute content and, and how people consume content. You know, these are the major things that we need to, major challenges that we need to address. And this is what our department at Hong Kong Design Institute is about. So uh, a possible model, you know, making, I added the word critical in terms of making, you know, that's very important. But design also is a cultural production. So looking at history, culture, heritage, the cultural and social dimensions of design, and also design as a people-centered activity. Um, how do we inform decisions based on user feedback? So this, I hope this was the presentation. Um, so uh, typography as a visual concept in terms of experimentation, graphic design, art direction, we uh, aim to create something new. The craft tradition, uh, you know, the, the, the craft that came from maybe letterpress printing, uh, typography typesetting, an apprenticeship mode. We aim to create something good. Uh, a user-centered uh, perspective, which is more about fitness for purpose, looking at user research testing or the idea of design thinking or context of use. I haven't really talked so much about that. The, well, Jerry talked about that yesterday, uh, the pursuit of knowledge, so which is about the truth, if it exists. Uh, it's about research, history, and theory, empirical studies. And uh, a lot of that pursuit of knowledge comes from the design process, which generates practical wisdom, which is also very important, but it's tested and not, not easily visible. It's internalized in the designer. I uh, just want to do a bit of advertising, I guess. <laughs> So we have uh, established a center, of, a center for Communication Design as an applied research center. So we are combining the, the things that I was talking about earlier. Uh, we have an applied research unit uh, that looks at uh, how users interact with communication. So um, we ac have actually, well, the, the eye tracking device actually delivered yesterday. I wasn't around to... to to see it, but <laughs> we're gonna try to get students to understand how, how communications actually work instead of just assuming things work that way. Uh, we have a project coming up with HSBC to look at the bilingual typographic specifications for the digital products in Hong Kong. So we have lots of other projects uh, from the research unit, but we also have a Hong Kong graphic archive um, we're getting a donation of more than uh, 10,000 uh, artifacts. Um, so design history in Hong Kong has not, not really been taught, definitely not taught. And there, there are a few books on it and essays, but really there hasn't been like a systematic uh, 
kind of way of looking at uh, the historical developments of Hong Kong design history or mapping the timeline. So we are going to work on that for years to come. And also uh, to look at print and publishing, uh, niche publishing, independent publishing uh, with letterpress and uh, reso printing and kind of encouraging students to publish their work. So that's what we, what is uh, happening at the Hong Kong Design Institute. These are some, some of the artifacts. So thank you very much. <laughs>